Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Ukraine had an historic opportunity this week to move toward full integration with the European Union. EU leaders wanted to seal an association agreement which would have drawn one of Europe's largest nations firmly into Brussels' orbit. But Ukraine's president walked away from the deal in favor of closer ties with Russia. Why? Well, my guest is Petro Poroshenko, billionaire Ukrainian businessman and former minister. So you, you were shocked. But I, was, I just I wonder whether, whether you can, now that you've heard the, the, the sort of very basic explanation from the Ukrainian government, which is that in the end they said they felt it was in Ukraine's national security interest not to sign this deal with the European Union. And further, they said they would look to, toward the customs union deal with, the, uh, with Russia and the former Soviet states because they said that would restore lost production, output, trade and economic relations that are vital to Ukraine. So that was their strategic decision. Can, can you understand it? No. I think uh, neither me, no Ukrainian politician, no Ukrainian people, nobody can understand that because, first of all, this is not true. We don't have any big danger if we signed up the association agreement with the European Union. Why? Because they have nothing anti-Russian. The main motivation for me as a Ukrainian politician, as a Ukrainian citizen, strongly voting for the European Union integration is necessity to reform my country, to, do, to modernize it. I was uh, the uh, foreign affairs minister, I was a minister of economy. And I am fighting for the right of Ukrainian, Ukrainian government, Ukrainian president, Ukrainian people and Ukrainian parliament to make a decision by themselves. We cannot accept any pressure, neither from Moscow, nor from Washington, nor from Brussels. We are ready to listen advisors, but we are fighting for our rights to make a decision ourselves. And if anybody tried to make a pressure on Ukraine, this is just united na the nation, and that's the results. Well, the nation, the nation and isn't united, and I just wonder if we just oh, look a little deeper into the way <laughs> Ukraine works today, whether you would accept some responsibility for the fact that Ukraine looks like a pretty dysfunctional country today with deep levels of corruption, with a real split between east and west, north and south of the country, with the Russian-speaking parts of Ukraine in a very different place from the more Western-oriented parts of Ukraine. Would you, as one of the oligarchs, if I can put it that way, of the country... No. But it's your well, <laughs> Would you accept some responsibility that for the last decade Ukraine hasn't been serious about reform? Uh, if you know a little bit better my political history, I always fighting against corruption. Is there now going to be some sort of mass public protest movement. This is exactly what you have a possibility to see yesterday. I was among the organizer of this meeting. I was on the stage addressing among the 200,000 people staying on the square. And that was exactly demonstrating that Ukrainian people are not ignored uh, their the choice. They, they hate the idea that somebody steal their dreams, European dreams, steal their hopes. And they are go for the street for the protesting. And today they bring the first results. Because today, uh, President of the European Union, Van Rompuy, uh, President of the European Commission, Manuel Barroso, sang a direct message to President Yanukovych. Mr. President, Please, here, the door of the European Union is still open. Well, let's return now to our top story uh, about Ukraine. And a delegation of senior Ukrainian politicians have been in London meeting ministers and MPs. Now, we had hoped to be speaking to the former heavyweight boxing champion and presidential hopeful Vitaly Klitschko, but unfortunately he's been taken ill. So I am now joined from Westminster by a Ukrainian MP and another presidential possible, Petro Poroshenko. Uh, Mr Poroshenko, how worried are you about uh, the, this build-up of Russian troops in Ukraine, on the borders of Ukraine? The situation in Ukraine is really difficult. Ukraine is under aggression of the Russian forces. Our Crimean territory is occupying, occupying by thousands of Russian forces with a smoke screen, a so-called fake referendum. And about 100,000 of Russian troops are near Ukrainian border, Russian-Ukrainian border. And I think that we try to do our best to avoid the escalation of military conflict. 
and we, uh, that is one of the purpose of our visit, for being well coordinated with the Americans and European Union partners. Okay, but do you think that the West is doing enough to help you? Are you getting all the support you need from the West, given that some have said that the sanctions that have been applied so far are quite timid? I think that the situation in the West is improving, especially taking into account today's statement of the Prime Minister Cameron in the House of Commons, when we absolutely give them a the firm position about the Russians and introducing the third wave of possible sanction against Russia. And but it's, position clear, number, that it's but clear that Western military action is off the table, isn't it? Um, look, if we're talking about the ground operation of the British soldiers in Ukraine, not at all. We have our own army. But if we're talking about the financial, economic sanction against Russian companies who financing and participating in this type of the aggression, that also can be quite effective. Because I think only well-coordinated action, Great Britain, whole European Union, United States, and the whole world can bring the effective solution for the deoccupying Crimea and peaceful way out from this current situation. Presidential elections day in Ukraine. Polls have just opened for people to choose a successor to Austria President Yanukovych. The vote comes amid an ongoing army offensive in the country's breakaway Donetsk and Lugansk regions. Now, the areas cut ties with Kiev after a referendum two weeks ago. They refused to recognize the legitimacy of the coup appointed authorities there. Ukraine's east and south became the main target of what Kiev called a counter terror operation. It launched several weeks ago against those who they described as separatists and terrorists, sending troops, aviation, artillery to these parts of the country to stop them. The situation today remains very tense with clashes continuing all over the region and casualties rising, which many believe not the best decoration for a big and a significant event such as President vote supposed to be. Just hours before it started, the leadership of the two self-proclaimed republics of Donetsk, we are now in its capital, and Lugansk declared they now form a, a, a union called Novorossiya, emphasizing their divorce with Kiev and claiming they will boycott the presidential vote here uh, in, uh, that uh, is happening amidst a large-scale military operation. The manifesto was signed by the leadership of these self-proclaimed republics, but also also by so-called people's representatives from six other Ukrainian regions of the countries east and south and it seems that they also share this mood today. So from what we could gather in Donetsk, there'll be no voting taking place at all. So we've come to Krasnyarmysk, which is to the west of Donetsk, uh, where we were told that there was some voting taking place. We're outside the central administration building, uh, and there's a group of police mixed with one of the pro-Ukrainian battalions providing security to the building, a lot of them armed. Uh, Krasnyarmysk is a city where, on the day of the referendum for the, the, the DPR, the Donetsk People's Republic, two people were shot dead by, allegedly, a pro-Ukrainian militia. But that was never confirmed, so their presence here is a little bit contentious. The Ukrainian government and its uh, proxy paramilitaries and the Dnipro Battalion and other groups like it have been, over the past couple of weeks, trying to secure towns like this to make sure the election does go ahead. And it seems to have been a success here in Krasnodonsk. So people are slowly coming in to vote here in uh, the local electoral commission in Krasnodonsk. Uh, they've said they've had no direct threats against them from the DPR. Uh, other uh, electoral commissions, though, in the city haven't opened this morning. Uh, some of the local residents say that's because they may fear that they may uh, come under a threat of violence. Um, but so far, it's been pretty peaceful here. This is Oleksandrivka. Uh, it's in the Donetsk region, but it's only one of four areas that I'm pretty certain uh, the elections are actually being held in, in this entire region. Uh, it's pretty pro-Ukrainian people speak Ukrainian in this village, Ukrainian flag. We're going to go see the polling. So this is a school. It's where the polling station is. And there's quite a lot of Ukrainian gunmen here to make sure that nothing happens. Uh, 
за кого вы проголосовали? А Бог не знает. Их 20 человек. Их не знаю. И того не знаю, и того не знаю. Это не, не, те, не те время. Раньше было приходить 100 грамм, мне надавали. Сейчас хлопцы дай сирельну, дай сирельну. А вы за кого проголосовали? Ну, Порошенко. А почему за Порошенко? Не знаю. Так у меня к нему симпатия. Мне верю, что, наверное, он сможет. Потому что из всех, наверное, он посильнее остальных. Нам надо сейчас сила, потому что вы видите, что творится в стране. И вы считаете, что он сможет Надеюсь. объединить Украину? Надеюсь. So that's the situation in Oleksandrivka. Voting is going normally here because the Ukrainian authorities have taken this part of the Donetsk region under control. We had to go through about five checkpoints, Ukrainian checkpoints, to get here. But in the rest of the Donetsk region, it's very different. We sent a camera person to the city of Donetsk and the surrounding areas. На каком этаже? Где? Умничка. Проверяем этажи, выходим. Спички нахуй, полиция. Ну, полиция, полиция. Еще один поменьше. Кто там? Садись. Не работает. Да, никого Я не понял. Охранник. Да не разбивай. Не разбивай. Открывай. Да люди выходят. Мы сейчас сами зайдем. Вообще у нас здесь вот всегда стоят. Вот здесь вот. А вот тут вот стоят столы. хотел проголосовать и не знаю где проголосовать. По городу объездил и не могу проголосовать. Ну что это такое, а? Ребята, никого не были. Вот проголосовал. Вообще никого не Uh, so we're outside the front of the Donetsk People's Republic's headquarters of the Regional Administration Building. Uh, there are some ballot boxes here, but obviously uh, we can see how they feel about the whole thing because at the front of them it says trash and they've filled it full of uh, rubbish. So yeah, not really much of a fans of the election here. Но Киев шлет бесов и танки, и НАТО стоит у ворот. Voting was never really going to happen in a lot of the areas of the Donetsk region because what was actually happening was thousands of people gathering in the center of the city to send up a big group of rebel fighters off to the battlefield. Мы самостоятельная Донецкая республика. Мы уже Новороссия. Новороссия. Все, Новороссия. Нас эти выборы не касаются. Это наши герои, понимаете, это герои. Мы их провожали вот со слезами на глазах, потому что эти ребята защищают наши жизни, жизни наших детей. Вы понимаете, они стоят насмерть, насмерть стоят. Как мы можем, я не знаю, я каждый божий день хожу в церковь и молю за их здоровье. Это, это страшно, когда погибают в мирное время. На нашей земле мы никуда не приходили, пришли к нам, на наши земли. Мы никуда не ходили, мы защищаем нашу землю. Но почему мы сделали свой выбор? Почему нам насильно диктует киевская хунта? Как нам жить, скажи? Идола Бендера и Шухевича в 
вдруг получилось так, что Донбасс приземлилось. Это российским летать нельзя. Российским журналистам нельзя обещать за правдой. И еще раз говорим, Донбасс, давай! Братья и сестры, я вообще-то не оратор, но сегодня такая ситуация, что... Они боятся нас даже с оружием в руках. На нас они взводили затворы четыре дня назад. Они смотрели на глаза и... Я вижу. Завалили, ни за что. Ни за что. Поры вызвали, нет. Да вызвали, а что? Собаки. Убили, убили. Вызовите скорую кто-нибудь. Вот раненый в голову. Органы срыв выборов председателем окружной комиссии, вот. которые не допускают нашего совета. Да. Секретаря Шкирика к работе. Почему он так не допускает? Потому что, насколько мне известно, насколько мне известно, факсограмма с ЦВК была утром. Эта факсограмма, насколько, как я думаю, по моему мнению, умышленно, умышленно не была зарегистрирована. И, соответственно, соответственно, таким образом получались формальные основания для того, чтобы не допускать секретаря к работе комиссии. Это и есть постанова, вот, заверенная печатью и подписью оригинал. А вот а тут мы видим факсограмму, вот, и мы не видим заверенный документ, вот, должным образом оформленный. А вот, по закону при назначении а вот, ЦВК должно прилюднить данную информацию в урядовом курьере. А вот. Какие вы шаги сделали для того, чтобы убедиться, что это действительно решение ЦВК, как вот, если вы комиссии? Вы связывались как-то с ним, вы сняли или ничего Значит, не делали? На сайте это есть информация? Да. На сайте. Мы, мы целый день заходили на сайт ЦВК, он не работал. At this school in central Kiev, there was a steady stream of voters. Inside, people lined up near voting booths that were draped in the national colors. Election workers tore off paper ballots one by one and handed them to eager voters. While waiting their turns, voters studied the long lists of candidates for president, mayor and local council. The ballot boxes slowly began to fill up as the election proceeded normally here in central Kiev. But that was not true everywhere. Polling stations did not open in parts of eastern Ukraine, where monitors say Russian-backed separatists intimidated voters and election workers. Elsewhere in the east, polling stations were open, but turnout was low. The problem threatened to impact as much as 20 percent of the population, not counting Russian-occupied Crimea, where no vote was scheduled.
polls indicate the front runner is Petro Poroshenko, a former foreign minister, but he may not get enough votes to avoid a runoff. So results from two exit polls are now showing uh, that Poroshenko, the chocolate king, has won the vote with uh, around 55% of the, of the vote across the country. Uh, and trailing behind him was Yulia Tymoshenko, the former prime minister, with just roughly around 12%. I mean, it was able to take place across a number of towns in the region, uh, mainly thanks to support from the military and oligarchs like Akhmatov, especially in the city here in Mariupol. Despite the huge queues and the crowds, and many people had to spend a few hours waiting to vote, we can say without doubt that this is one of the most democratic, free and transparent election in the history of Ukraine. The main goal of my presidency will be to establish peace and to preserve the unity. And it will be one of my first priorities as president to solve the Crimea problem and to get Crimea back. And I want to confirm that EU integration will be a priority of the new government. And even before inauguration, I will be having meetings and talks at the highest level with international leaders. And they will formulate the international agenda of the new government. I'm also pleased that what started here on the 29th of March in this building, together with Vitaly Klitschko, who you can see on his right, the former boxer, we managed to win. Not only me as a president, but also a victory for Kiev. As Vitaly Klitschko has been elected the mayor of Kiev, I've already made instructions to find an international banking consultancy to find a proper asset management fund who will be in charge of selling my assets. I've also stressed a few times during the election campaign that I will probably, as for Channel 5 television, I, I won't sell Channel 5 television because it wasn't for sale at any time in the past. And besides, it's not strictly a business asset. Asking about the future prime minister, do you uh, intend to keep Arseniy Yatsenyuk as a prime minister? And he's answering, as you well know, Poroshenko is saying, the constitution of Ukraine stipulates that the president does not put forward a candidate for prime minister's position. It's the responsibility of parliament. And I think that Mr. Yatsenyuk as a prime minister is very efficient. And I hope for a fruitful relationship with him and I have no plans to change Prime Minister. Many international correspondents here have spent a lot of time in Donbass in the last few weeks talking to those men with guns. They don't seem to have any interest in negotiations. So if you can't get them to talk to the table, how are you going to take back those areas that they control without the first few months of your presidency being drenched in blood? Look, this is not a surprise for me that the terrorists also don't have any interest to speak with the Ukrainian authorities. They don't have any interest to speak with nobody. The same way like Somalian pirates. They don't need anything. They just want to conserve the illegal uh, situation there when they have a uh, so-called bandit state which keep on the machine gun forces. This is not acceptable. But by the way, on the Donbass, these people are representing nobody. These people just want to, that everybody afraid of them. That's the only way how they can survive. Don't give them any chance. Because we will fight, but for the trust of the people of Donbass. These people are not defending, again, not, neither federalization, no Russian language, no rights of these people. They just murdered her. They just abandoned. They just a killer. They just a terrorist. That's the case. And if you expected that I will find out the support of these people, no way, no chance. In no in no civilized country of the world, nobody have a negotiation with a terrorist. We are a civilized country, and we will again fight for the trust of the people of Donbas. We will propose the amnesty for those 
who can accept uh, disarmed and not directly involved in the crimes, not only in, in, the, in the killing of the people. And we will uh, defend and clean and bring the peace on the Donbass, including the fighting against terror. This is the one of the main functions of the state, to defend the people. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe has praised Ukraine for holding a presidential election it said was in line with international commitment and respected fundamental freedoms despite hostile activity by Kremlin-backed groups in the East. OSCE head Joao Soares said Ukrainians had seized the opportunity to take part in a democratic process. Sorez said Ukraine's electoral authorities had made genuine efforts to conduct voting throughout the country, despite persistent unrest and violence in the country's east. The international observers, who released the report on Monday, also decried forced closures of district election commissions by armed groups, abductions, death threats, forced entry into private homes, and the seizure of equipment and election material, saying they were aimed at denying citizens their right to vote. Hello, Evgeny. You know the situation in Ukraine very well. What's the mood in Russia looking at the election results? And how, to your mind, is Russia going to create its foreign policy with its neighbor who's just chosen its new leader? I think a lot of people in Russia felt they could relax a bit after the election took place on Sunday. A lot of people accepted the results because at least this was the first event that looked like it was more or less legal. And this election is the first legitimate process during the last six months of chaos. If we speak about the further relationship between Kiev and Moscow, I think here everybody will stick to their positions because Russia has announced its conditions many times. The Ukrainian far-right party got the support of less than 1% of Ukrainians. Moscow has blamed Kiev for having fascist and extremist support. Will Russia change its rhetoric now? Indeed, only 0.68% of the voters supported the right sector candidate Yarosh. But let's have a look at who came in after Poroshenko. It was Timoshenko, and she has said before in a private discussion to drop the atomic bomb on Moscow. Then Oleg Lashko was after her, as we see, and he's a fascist to my mind, an unbalanced person who's leading and taking part in the punitive operation in the east of Ukraine. Now it's necessary to understand what position Petro Poroshenko takes takes. He supports the powerful suppression of the uprising in the southeast. But what's more, it's not an easy situation for him right now. He has to please Washington and West Ukraine at the same time. And he needs to start a dialogue with the southeast. Apart from being the head of the country's biggest chocolate company, he owns a TV channel in Ukraine, which he refuses to sell. As president, officially, he can't have any business assets. Well, Poroshenko has also been loyal to all Ukrainian presidents, including the last one, Viktor Yanukovych, who Poroshenko now wants to see in jail. But let's have a closer look at how he did at the polls. Pretty well. Take a look at this. Poroshenko's main election rival, XPM Yulia Tymoshenko, she's far behind with only 13% supporting her. Third runner up, the leader of the Radical Party, that's the actual official name of that party. Well, neo fascist groups' leaders who took part in the violent Maidan movement didn't get much support. Clearly, Ukrainian people are against nationalism, racism, and hatred, the right sector, and Svoboda Party, which helped overthrow the government back in February. This vote hopefully will see radicals who've been holding high positions in the interim government out for good. Well, the East didn't vote. Most of the polling stations were closed. This video shows how ballot boxes were smashed there. Ballot papers were either burned or torn apart. Kiev says just over 10 percent managed to vote in that part of the country. Ну не мы же стреляли, правильно? Нет, Зачем на нас стрелять? Я стреляла или кто это? Да, это короче нас. Они что, чокнутые вообще уже? Это короче нас стреляли.
Казани, но около вот, там, пенсионная Прохоренко Ольга Миколаева. Прохоренко Ольга. Вот. Тварь, будьте вы прокляты, суки. А ну отойдите оттуда. Я сейчас это сразу, блядь, немедленно выкладываю в интернет. people came to the airport uh, there was no gunfight uh, there was no uh, any shooting uh, they just uh, told that Ukrainian army should leave an airport territory and we are waiting until the situation is solved Быстрее, а то у нас следующего переулка обойдут. Давай, бегом, 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 загрузились на базу, там сбор. Давайте быстрее, быстрее, дядя, быстрее. Дядя, сколько их против вас там воюют? Да вчера их высадило, четыре вертушки. Сколько в численности? Я хер его, может роты 3-4. Wow, yeah, look, it's a hind attack helicopter. It's coming under fire from the rebels. All, the, all around us, they're firing. That helicopter's really low. Все живы! Да не, надо зайти, надо все... Блядь, заходим. Пиздец, сука, ебаный. Он по ней же стрелял, блядь, тупо.
ТЦ это называется. Отстреливать Пушки работают. Пушки работают. Wow. That's the helicopter, I think. That here it is. It's coming down. It just fired what we think were rockets, and uh, it's popping flares again, so that it can't get hit by anti-aircraft missiles. You can hear the return fire from the rebels further into the city. Only a few hours after yesterday's presidential elections, uh, the, the government announced that they would restart the anti-terror operation that they paused for the elections. And this, the actions today around the airport are very clear that they really, really mean business this time. They're not messing around. They're hitting this with everything they've got. Транзиты, транзиты. Перебежки! Перебежки! О, We're at the scene of what looks like a, a truck crash. We heard that this was uh, carrying wounded from the airport, uh, Donetsk People's Republic wounded, and somehow it crashed here. And we're not sure how that happened. Some saying it was an RPG, some saying the, the driver was shot dead. Все равно бы правды на весь мир не расскажете. Брехню начнете потом. Уходи, давай, 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 давай. Я видел списки, по которым значит, доставлено сюда 33 бойца. Все бойцы имеют огнестрельные ранения, пулевые, осколочные, взрывные. Вот все, что я могу сказать на сегодняшний момент. Вот на данное число, на сейчас. We failed because their numbers were greater than ours several fold. We seized the main airport building, but afterwards they started shelling, firing from jet fighters and helicopters. He also has his own share of injuries and says he was shot in the leg. A day after Ukrainian forces launched airstrikes to drive separatists from the airport, the government says it will press on until, quote, not a single terrorist is left.
Реально не смешно, ребята покупают бронежилеты. Два человека знаю. Три. Три. Кто давал команду куплять? Была команда выезжать в Мелитку. Еще одна ракета. Um, you have seen reports, I uh, presume, of the fighting that's going on in Donetsk. I'm wondering if you have anything um, to say about that. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Uh, well, first, uh, let me, of course, I, I know we put out a statement from the Secretary yesterday about the successful uh, elections uh, this weekend, uh, so I would point everyone to that. Uh, we look forward to, of course, working with President-elect Poroshenko and the people of Ukraine to build on uh, the vic this victory for democracy. Do you believe that everything the Ukrainian authorities have done to this point in trying to maintain law and order has been, has been reasonable? Has a, a well, if, if we, we have concerns, we will express them, but um, certainly... As of this moment, you don't have any concerns? I, I am not expressing a concern about the events of, over the course of the weekend, no. Uh, uh, in terms of the Ukrainian authorities, no. Okay, so in, in, in the view of the State Department, view of the administration is that what is happening on the ground in the east right now in Donetsk and other, and other places where there are clashes, where there's fighting, that is all the fault of the separatists? Well, that, again, they, obviously, they're the instigators. Obviously, they are certainly. We believe they're the instigators. Yes, and we believe, and I think there's broad reporting on their involvement in what's happening at the airport or what happened at the airport over the course of the weekend. Okay. I think there's a much question. Well, about that. The, but there are a lot of there are a lot of reports from my news organization from from others as mm -hmm. well that th this isn't entirely one sided. That I mean, and the separatists, some of the separatist leaders say that. They've been that the Ukrainian authorities have been shooting at uh, civilians, but you don't, you haven't seen that. Well, if we have concerns, we'll express I mean, them. Are the se sectoral sanctions for alleged attempts to disrupt the election are still a possibility? Is that? We said that, and if they cross the border, there are a range of factors that no, we're no, looking no, at. But specifically mm -hmm. about the election, mm -hmm. the, those sanctions are still on the table. I mean, it seems to me if you call the election a victory for democracy. Any attempt to disrupt it was unsuccessful, no? Well, Matt, we will continue to have these discussions internally. There were attempts to disrupt in parts of Ukraine. Um, we will look at what that means and if it means uh, anything in terms of uh, next round of sanctions. Uh, in other words, you're saying that attempts to disrupt, even if they are unsuccessful, could be, could 
be a trigger. Well, there were for successful sanctions. attempts to disrupt in some parts of Ukraine. Yeah, uh, you whether still acknowledge the elections? Of course, because there was a, a high turnout uh, nationwide, and we feel this was a successful election. But we'll look at a range of factors. I don't have anything to announce or outline for all of you today. Well, the president has approved three tranches of non-lethal security assistance to the Ukrainian military and border services so far. Uh, we continue to review additional Ukrainian requests. Our main focus continues to be on supporting economic and diplomatic efforts. Uh, we don't see a military solution as the uh, outcome to this crisis, uh, but uh, we, and we're not considering lethal assistance, but we'll continue to review their requests. Wait a second. You don't consider mili a military solution? You don't just th believe there's a military solution? Why, so why are you saying that the Ukrainian government has is doing the right thing and going after we, because we believe, Matt, that maintaining stability and order in their own country, uh, right. they have every right to do that. Right, but isn't that a military solution? Uh, that is not a military solution. No? We still okay. believe this will be uh, resolved through dialogue between okay. the parties, which is what we'll continue to encourage. <laughs> Дай большой. Это что ты можешь взять? Теплый. Горячий. Ух, тихо, 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 тихо. Пошли, пошли, пошли. Пошли, короче, люблю тебя. Смотри, снимай, 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 туда, смотри. Блять, мы на горе, нас может Okay. <laughs>
Украинские каналы не стесняются переворачивать все с ног на голову. Вот ведущий рассказывает о событиях в Славянске. Террористы обстреляли школу и жилые здания. Все это организовали бандиты, чтобы обвинить украинских силовиков в насилии и убийстве мирного населения. Показывают школу с пробитой крышей, где явно видно, что снаряд попал сверху. Это как, каким вообще оружием стреляют сепаратисты? Они вверх стреляют, куда Бог пошлет, как бы. А потом эти снаряды падают. Ну, то есть бред сумасшедшего. Украинцы убивают украинцев. И вот трупы украинцев на украинских журналистах. Пропагандисты действуют избирательно. Почему-то слова этой женщины остались за кадром. Вы не слышите, откуда летит? Вы меня извините, и осколки летят. Наша доблестная армия. За что мы только налоги платим, чтобы нас убивали? Она выскочила, получается, с работы. И в этот момент выстрелили. Ну, я с кулак ударил ее. И все. Я не знаю, я была дома. Позвонила сотрудница, другая говорит, да. Оли больше нету. The Ukrainian army has hit a residential area with artillery shelling. At least nine people have been injured, among them a four-year-old. Что ж вы с нами делаете, фашисты? Фашисты, как можно вообще? Что ж вы с нами? Дети маленькие, по полтора года, вы же посмотрите, что она делает. Снимайте, снимайте, что творят, радость все делать я. Сука зашла в палатку и так бахнула моментально все. И все не знаю, что дальше делать. Now, those were the scenes from the city of Slavyansk in the rest of east of the country, the Donetsk region. Also there, though, an artillery shell hit a school, shattering the roof of the building. Now, there was a break between classes at that moment, and no one was injured. Children and teachers from the school and a nearby kindergarten had to take cover in a basement. We ran with the first-year children. We heard a loud bang. We were very scared. Everyone was screaming. We didn't know where to run. My son was crying. He had a panic attack. It's awful that children are being put through this. How could they shell the city without making sure there were no children there? focus at the moment is also on the region of Lugansk. Now, we have been hearing reports that a military base there has seen some gunfire. What we are hearing is that one anti-government fighter was killed. There were several injuries on both sides. And what triggered the event was actually when some families of soldiers who were serving time at that base appealed to these anti-government fighters to go there and, to quote these families, rescue them. These soldiers had actually seen their military service End. We understand that most of them wanted to leave the base, and according to their families, they were being prevented from doing so. Since then, the base has been taken over by these anti-government forces. Most of the soldiers have actually gone home. We understand that we're talking about 80 soldiers. They've also handed over their weapons to these anti-government fighters. <laughs> Ребята, не светите, могут стрелять. Значит, казар. Готовится. 
Сюда, сюда, сюда. Украинские сайты вот так описывают вчерашние события в Луганске. Террористы захватили здание нацгвардии в Луганске, прикрываясь людьми. На самом деле на этих кадрах украинские военные, которые отказываются выполнять преступные приказы. За ними пришли родители и бойцы народного ополчения. Сын у меня там полгода служил. С родником. Хотел в армию. Хотел в армию. Сопротивлялась, он все равно ушел. Не будем трудиться. На... The rally follows two days of fighting in the city between Ukrainian forces and pro-Russian separatists. A situation Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says is pushing the country to the brink of civil war. Those who pursued that policy were not at all concerned that the wedge that they try to drive between different branches of European civilization is being driven across the Ukrainian people, and in essence that people are being pushed into the abyss of fratricidal war. In the self-declared republic, the barricades are still coming up. Some are living in fear. Of course I'm afraid. My parents called me last night and said they were in the basement because they heard the sounds of jets and shooting. We don't know who shoots or where they shoot. Nobody tells us anything, and we don't know anything. Government forces killed dozens of rebel fighters Monday and Tuesday in an assault to retake the airport, which rebels had seized the morning after Ukrainians overwhelmingly elected Petro Poroshenko as president. Эвакуация детей в Крым. Вот здесь хоз техника. Мы хотели давно уехать, но очень сомневались. Мы надеялись, что будет все хорошо. Поэтому мы и до последнего сидели дома. Позавчера сильно стреляли. Много людей пострадало, попали в дома, в жилые. Я же говорю, очень погибло много людей. Right on the outskirts of Slavyansk. Um, 
This uh, feed factory has seen a lot of fighting because it's right next to Slavyansk where the pro-Russia separatists have their stronghold. And there are refugees streaming out of the city because the fighting in the city has uh, increased over the last couple of days. And so now people are leaving with their children, with their things. Even here through the checkpoint before they've gotten out, there's already shooting happening. What was the shooting about just now? Okay, they noticed suspicious movement in the bushes. So it could be some kind of reconnaissance of the terrorists. So that's why they, that's why they decided to open fire. To open fire. Got it. Okay. Cars coming. They're checking cars coming out of Slavyansk, uh, heading in the direction of uh, Kharkiv. A lot of people leaving today. А вы выезжаете из Славянска надолго или вы просто по делам? Как получится. Как получится. Ну из-за чего вы выезжаете? Пока не стабилизируется ситуация в Славянске. Понятно. Спасибо. По дороге до города Славянск мы проезжали на один блокпост. Вот этот пост фактично передостанній. За ним реальна передова, а далі місто Слов'янськ і місцеві жителі. Це вже місто Слов'янськ, а ось це останній блокпост. Саме він вважається найбільш небезпечним, адже сепаратисти постійно його обстрілюють. Движення бачу, движення на 12-11 часов, це буде дозволити відкрити вогонь. Де? Комешар? Там під горою, під горою ти дим. Прикликай. Плюс! Готові? Під гору! Короткими огонь! preparing the coffins as the death toll mounts in Ukraine. After weeks of Kiev accusing Russia of involvement in the uprising, a rebel leader admits that some fighters who died in a fierce government offensive had been volunteers from Russia. I can only say that I hope Ukraine makes up its mind and will not bring its troops into the city, especially when the city is surrounded by the Ukrainian troops, which could be enough. If they want a war, it will be a slaughter from both sides. There are losses on all sides. Acting Ukrainian President Alexander Torchinov confirms that at least 14 Ukrainian soldiers were killed Thursday when pro-Russian separatists shot down an army helicopter. I have just received information from the area near Slavyansk that terrorists with Russian weapons have shot our helicopter carrying soldiers for rotation. Fourteen of our soldiers died, including General Kolchetsky. 
Ukraine's acting defense minister said they would press ahead and crush rebellions in the east. This following the election of a new president. But Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, says the violence must stop. The matter can no longer be moved forward just by simple talks. Perhaps more efficient mediation efforts are needed to stop the violence, including, above all, the punitive operation and to start dialogue with mutual respect. So far, few signs of resolution in the east, where pro-Russian separatists man checkpoints on the way to the airport where two days of clashes left scores dead. A huge blow to the Ukrainian military, 14 soldiers dead as this helicopter was shot down near Slavyansk. Uh, we understand that one of them, one of the 14 was a, an army general uh, and the president has said that the helicopter was transporting personnel to a military base for a change of shift when it was shot down by the rebels. Now, Slavyansk has long been the sort of ep epicenter of heavy fighting in eastern Ukraine. It fell to rebel control early on in this conflict, and it is now one of those areas that the Ukrainian president-elect is uh, vowing to push forward and to try to retake. Uh, and what of the pro-Russian rebels who are still where you are in Donetsk? I mean, are they fortifying their positions there? Well, certainly uh, they attempted to regroup when the Ukrainian uh, military launched a huge air assault on the airport here in Donetsk on Monday and Tuesday to try to wrest it back from rebel control. The rebels had tried to seize it on Monday morning and w we were outside the airport. We watched the whole thing unfold as the Ukrainian jets arrived, pounded rebel positions and then watched, we watched as rebel insurgents tried to regroup. Now, uh, the airport itself, it seems to have been retaken by the Ukrainian military, but clearly what has happened now is that uh, rebel are trying to regroup to try to launch counter-offensives. There's various reports of troop movement on the outskirts of Donetsk. Uh, so clearly that both sides are digging in, vowing to, uh, to, to remain tough. Russian President Vladimir Putin, President of Kazakhstan Nursultan Nazarbayev and President of Belarus Alexander Lukashenko signed the historic Eurasian Economic Union, which will come into effect in January 2015. Kyiv refuses to pay for Russian gas. Although all of the agreements, Ukraine still resists discharging of the obligations on the contract. This time the Ukrainian side demand to fix a price at the level of $268.50 for 1,000 cubic meter. Interim President Artur Chinov claimed that he considers possible to impose the defense emergency in Lugansk and Donetsk region. State of emergency is not a solution anymore. Now we should think about the defense emergency. These questions is discussed by the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. We could not impose it earlier because of the presidential elections, said Turchinov. It's also worth noting that the new president-elect Petro Poroshenko said in his victory speech on Monday that he would now go about this anti-terrorist operation, as they call it, with renewed vigor, that he was determined with the backing of what he will feel is a resounding democratic mandate in this country, that this should be over in hours, were his words. I think a lot of people thought at the time that he may come to live to regret that choice of words. You know, this is several days later now, and you can see from what is happening now that the fighting in this area is escalating. It is very far from being over within a number of hours. And how is the fighting being presented on the Russian media? Well, they will show this as Ukrainian authorities fighting against freedom fighters. I mean, they have described the separatists, the anti-government protesters, however you might describe them. They have described them here as supporters of federalism. They have presented them very much as being citizens who are demanding their democratic right, their right to self-determination. And they have portrayed this throughout as an offensive being launched against its own citizens by what they have repeatedly referred to as the junta in Kiev. They have backtracked slightly on that rhetoric, know that there is a president-elect in that country, but they have nevertheless continued to demand that Kiev stops this military operation in its eastern regions, and they will be presenting this as further evidence of the aggression of those authorities in Kiev against what insists are its own citizens in the east. Они заиграли, заиграли с народом, ищет террористов, ищет 
будь ласка, колеги, народний депутат Герман. І я дам можливість всім висловитись. Шановні народні депутати, я погоджуюсь в тому, що ті, хто роздирають нашу державу і став на бік сепаратизму, повинні бути з наших лав виключені. Але я вважаю, що заяви депутатів від партії «Свободи» з парламентської трибуни про те, що треба розстрілювати російськомовних – Наробили Україні більше шкоди, ніж 100 царьових разом взятих. There are two narratives or stories or explanations. The official Washington and Brussels NATO explanation is, and this is endorsed virtually without exception in the mainstream media, is that the United States and Europe benignly offered Ukraine back in November 2013 an economic relationship with the European Union just to help Ukraine become a prosperous society. And Putin, for whatever reason, and there are various reasons given, but generally speaking, because he's a very bad person, tried to stop that by threatening the then president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, and offering him uh, a better financial deal. Yanukovych accepted Putin's offer. Ukrainian people came out in the streets to protest at the Maidan Square. Uh, then, as time went on, in February of 2014, the Maidan demonstrators uh, began to be uh, infiltrated by radicals, partly from Western Ukraine. Violence ensued. Uh, Yanukovych fled the country and a new government supported by the street took power in Kiev. That's the government that's in power today and which we, the United States and Europe, uh, support with extraordinary enthusiasm. Now, the alternative narrative is this. The beginning in the 1990s, the United States began to move NATO, our Cold War military alliance in Europe, ever closer to post-Soviet, post-Soviet Russia's borders. And by the time the Ukrainian crisis rolled around, NATO was already in the Baltics. Uh, but the deal was that Germany, in the words of, of, of the first President Bush's Secretary of State, James Baker, NATO would not move, and I quote, one inch to the east from Germany. In other words, there would be no NATO expansion. That promise was broken by Clinton and then again by Bush. Russia saw this as an attempt to smuggle Ukraine into NATO through the back door. And Russia was right, because that agreement, which is about a thousand pages long, included a section on security. And had Ukraine signed that agreement, it would have obliged Ukraine, though the word NATO is not used, to abide by all of the European Union's military and security policies, in other words, NATO. So Russia began to push back. There's a new president. He is one of the Ukrainian oligarchs, the people who took Soviet-era property in the 1990s and became billionaires. Uh, more importantly, though, he also has a media empire, including a national television station in Ukraine. And for the last four or five months, he's used that uh, station to polish his image, to kind of scrape off the oligarchical aspects and present himself as a benign, moderate man. But there are several problems. First of all, it's a technical point, but since February, which was a coup when they overthrew the elected president of, of Ukraine, the street did, and put in this government, they reverted to the 2007 Constitution, which gives far more power to the parliament, which is the basis of the government in Kiev, than it does to the president. So it's not clear that Poroshenko has much power. Secondly, he said, in my judgment, absolutely the wrong thing when he was elected uh, on Sunday. He said he was going to continue and intensify what Kiev, the government we back, calls, I quote, its anti-terrorist operation against the pro-Russian insurgents in south and eastern Ukraine. Now, stop and think a minute. Clearly, Ukraine is a very diverse, divided country that is going through a kind of proto-civil war. Why would you call your fellow citizens, if you saw them as that, terrorist? If you write your opponents out of humanity, out of legitimacy, 
uh, then there's just more war ahead. Now, that's what's happening in Ukraine. Um, do you have any comment or concern about the situation in the East right now at the, in the wake of this helicopter being downed uh, and these photographs that appear to show innocent, uh, civilians, including children, lying dead in the streets? Are, the other day you said that you didn't have any particular concerns about the Ukrainian authorities' use of force, but you did have concerns about the separatists um, and you were urging the Russians to rein them in. Do you now, do you have concerns about the Ukrainian authority, the, about the use, the, the use of force by the Ukrainian authorities, or is it still the, are you still the same, in the same spot? Nothing has changed. Our, our broad view, as you know, is that uh, de-escalation is the proper path forward, but many challenges remain on the ground. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, as you noted, uh, today heavily armed separatists in Slovyansk shot down a military transport helicopter, killing 14 people. Uh, four OSCE observers that were abducted on May 26th uh, have, uh, are continue to be uh, held. Um, separatists reportedly, including many from Russia, attempted to seize the airport in Donetsk on Monday. So there are obviously a range of uh, recent events in isolated areas that we remain concerned about. and. Um, challenges remain. But you still believe that the Ukrainian authorities are acting within their, they're acting appropriately and within, within their right to maintain order in these clashes that are going on in the, in the East? You still believe Ukrainian authorities have the right to uphold law and order in their own country. And you yeah. don't believe that they're using disproportionate force or attacking civilians? Uh, that is not a concern I'm aware of. Um, uh, Kiev has launched, and this, I mean launched, this is real military operation helicopter gunships, tanks, and they're doing this under the justifiable, they think, uh, accusation that these people are nothing but terrorists. Hmm. How, they, how they came to that term is clear for political reasons. But here's the really worrisome part, or it should be for you and me, Tom. The United States government is endorsing this. Uh, the woman who is the face and voice of the State Department, Jen Piskoski, I think it's pronounced, uh, almost on a daily basis, says that all Kiev is doing is a rightful attempt to restore law, law and order. And this includes, remember, what happened on May 2nd, when 40-plus pro-Russian or at least anti-Kiev people were burned alive in a building in Odessa. It includes what's happening all across uh, towns in southern and eastern Ukraine where civilians are dying because, Tom, you know, I know from our own experience with the American army that the moment tanks enter a residential area or fire upon a residential area, civilians die. So in my view, what the Kiev government should be doing and what Washington should be demanding it do, because that Kiev government would not exist without the backing of Washington, is that instead of sending troops to southeastern Ukraine, it should be sending negotiators because the issues to be negotiated are clear to everyone. And it will happen eventually unless there's all out war. The only question is how many innocent people are going to die between now and then? <laughs> было пораньше приходить, когда тут все в горячем виде было. Понимаешь, как? У нас нет возможности выйти в открытое поле, с ними воевать. У нас, да, маловато техники, вооружение есть. Их не броню бить будем, но только вот здесь, на своей линии, на которой окопались. А выйти в чистое поле нас могут разместить. У нас, у нас есть вдохновение, желание, но нет технической возможности.
Армию победить можно, народ нельзя победить. А народ, который вот славянский, свободолюбивый народ, не только славянск, восточная Украина, Донецкая область, Луганская область, они поднялись и не хотят уже жить с этими фашистами, которые трактуют превыше всего, превыше всякой человеческой гуманности национализм. Как можно понимать людей, которые сжигают живьем людей, свои же украинцы, украинцев. И здесь еще, Виталик, вот какой вопрос. Они говорят, мы оккупанты. А что мы оккупировали? Я здесь живу, здесь моя семья, здесь родня моей жены, корни, сестры, Это братья, племянники. Было. Это наша земля, наш Донбасс. Мы же не пошли на Львовщину, а шли сюда, набрали национальную гвардию, пятый сектор, и пришли нас освобождать. Или нас освободить землю нашу, а нас в нее закопать. Или... Или освободить полностью нас, от нас самих. Это радость была какая. Я вспоминаю, как в этом году мы 9 мая проводили, мы радовались. Вот у меня было настроение такое радостное, что это праздник был народа, ликовал народ. Именно в этот период, что кругом идет вот эта суматоха неразбериха, народ... Свободные пытаются задавить, а народ с радостью вышел и провел этот митинг. Такая красота была вот для, в, в душе. Что, Михаил? Это кружку еще, бля. Не ругайся. Там вот просто покажите как. Да я ж видео снимаю. А, видео? Да, да. Телефон. Садись, садись. Ой, блядь. Стой. Стой. Смотри. Да нет, это только начало. А ты слышал? Конечно, у меня здесь есть нелепый номер. Да, почему? А кочка? Нет. Серег, потуши, а? Да, ну ты что, боку видишь? На, я тебе дам. Вот она наша наша шашка. Ох ты, блядь. Ох ты, блядь. Ох ты, блядь. Это очень близко. Ну, потом хочется будем идти, я вам дам пачку. Крысыни. пошли долбить это так чтобы мы не расслаблялись а ты что Тишина подозрительная. Что, снаряды закончили? Блять, так можно даже охуяя. Сейчас бронежилет не спасет, да ёбки, куски, блядь, там грамм по 120 лет. Да мы восьмой класс защиты зашли на запчасти. Ой, рядышком. Блин, а я шлепки на улице оставил. Что ты смеешься? Я скидок... Слушай, у меня есть рожок трассировок, давай он по зеленке пошмаляем, чтобы они не расслаблялись. Это к Питеру. К Питеру, да? Тебе ха-ха, я свои носки один нашел, второй нет. После... Да, 
Нормально, нормально вовремя уйти в укрытие. Штаны вот. мокрые, жалко. А Что? чего? Да я вот здесь... Лучше обоссаться до боя, чем не, бою не, обосраться. Не, не, я не а. Я здесь вот притулился, чтобы а. обстрел отанцировал. Только а. после дождя выйти, то снова штаны. Цицил. Все да, на месте, нет. живы, здоровы. Locals saying that Ukrainian forces again have started shelling Ukraine's eastern city of Slavyansk. That as the night fell, and many parents had already decided their children should flee the city. In fact, many were evacuated to Crimea, where they can now hope to spend their holidays in peace. So the journey wasn't entirely trouble-free. Paula Slier now is in the region for more details here. Paula, good morning to you. What's the latest where you are, please? Well, in the last two days, more and more civilians have found themselves in the line of fire. There was a children's hospital that was shelled. A number of residential buildings have been attacked. At the same time, there was a school and a kindergarten that came under fire. Locals tell us on Friday there was a lull in fighting. Presumably, this was to coincide with the fact that it was the last day of school. But what people on the ground are telling us is that overnight shelling in the eastern Ukrainian town of Slavyansk resumed. Now, at least 200 children have been evacuated from the town to the resort of Crimea. This was a journey that was not without its hiccups. But what we do understand is that the children are now safely in Crimea. Of course, they had to face the hardiest journey of unsafe roads. This was not the only problem. There was also the question of alerting the Ukrainian authorities that there were buses with children making their way through this territory. We did manage to catch up with a few of the children, and this is what they told us. The city often comes under mortar shelling. People get hurt as a result. A mortar splinter the size of a walnut hit my grandfather's leg, even pierced the bone. If it went a little deeper, it could hit an artery, and that would be it for him. It is so unusually calm and quiet here. No explosions going off as compared to what we left in Slavyansk. It was scary. Nobody expected that things like that could start happening in our small town that was never famous for anything. I was very scared. There were explosions. My dad just celebrated his birthday and he was walking by the sound of shelling that day. I'm really glad I'm here now. It's calm here. We feel protected. What was frightening? When shells fly by your window or you hear shots fired nearby. That's what's frightening. As the violence seemingly spirals out of control, more and more innocent people are being hurt and even killed. Tomorrow is the ultimatum which the anti-government fighters have been given. It expires and by this time they need to lay down weapons or face the full wrath of the Kiev government. So many people here on the ground expect that the violence we've witnessed over the past few days is just a taste of what's to come. Um, the, yeah, yeah on the call. Mm -hmm. The Russians say that uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov asked Secretary Kerry to use his influence with the authorities in Kiev to stop the um, counterterrorism operation, the military operation in the east. Um, is that correct, one? And if it is, is the administration willing to do such a thing? Well, um, I'm not going to read out, as you know, Foreign Minister Lavrov's comments or views. Um, but I will say, as we've talked about a little bit in here, that we have a fundamental disagreement uh, with the Russians about what the Ukrainian government is doing and the validity of uh, their own right to, uh, to uh, maintain calm and order in their own country. Uh, and in our view, um, since the beginning of the unrest, uh, while we've seen numerous human rights abuses by the separatists, including murder, kidnapping, and looting, uh, the Ukrainian government uh, has, continues to have, uh, the responsibility to enforce law and order on its territory. And while unfortunate incidents will always happen uh, in a combat zone, we commend and continue to commend the Ukrainian government's restraint and efforts to limit dam damage and injury to the civilian population. So our view has consistently been that they have every right to uh, take steps to maintain law and order in their own country. But you're acknowledging that there have been, as what you call, unfortunate incidents. Well, there have been reports of them, Matt, yes. Right, but, but committed not just, and committed by the, the Ukrainian military I'm or not, by the I'm not placing the blame. Separatists. I'm suggesting that in uh, any 
conflict like this, uh, that occurs. That's unfortunate. They've taken every step possible to uh, exercise restraint while trying to maintain law and order in their own country. Okay, you, so you believe that the, the administration believes that the Ukrainian military has shown restraint in, the, in its operations in the east? Yes. Um, okay. Вон стоит Карачун, вышка. Там находится украинская армия. Немного из географии Славянска. В ту сторону. Километров так 10. Комбикормовый завод. Там находится блокпост украинской армии. В ту сторону тоже. Километров 10 находится блокпост украинской армии. В ту сторону Семеновка, километров 20, наверное. Там каждую ночь у нас что-то громыхает. В Украине вот воронка, вот разбитые стекла. Завода. Вот поваленные деревья, ну уже много всех этих. Вы понимаете, что украинская армия, там стоит гаубица, блин, на этом карачине. И они стреляют по нам. Вывозят детей, люди текают. Они по нам стреляют. Не пошел туда, бать. Ни хрена ж тебе. По вертолет шел, да? Да. Хреначит. С вертолета же вернул два раза. Да. Я рос. Да, у нас были смерти. Верно. Но, но, но. Я подчеркиваю, к сожалению, они понесли потери. В них никто не хотел стрелять. Убивать живых людей никто не хотел. Понимаете? Всегда есть диалог. Но когда стреляют в тебя, то ты вынужден стрелять в ответ. И чем эффективнее ты это делаешь, тем больше шансов, что тебя не убьют. Там были хорошие пацаны. Там, там был Кировоградский спецназ. Это, это отличные воины. Это настоящие сыны своих матерей. Настоящие сыны своей родины. Они хорошие пацаны. Настоящие. Слава им, честь им. Понимаешь? Но там вмешались наемники. Они стреляли и в пацанов из Кировоградского спецназа, и в нас. В Восток. Объясняю, повторился киевский сценарий. Понятно? 
То есть они убивали и спецназовца, и нас. Для того, чтобы мы убивали друг друга. Суперавиация, да, и минометчики начали по квадратно уничтожать частный сектор. Зачем? Зачем? Ну что же вы делаете? Там же, там же мирные люди живут. Там же, возможно, дети, старики, женщины. Что вы делаете? А, я, я забыл. Они, наверное, спишут на то, что э, ошиблись координатами. Или еще что. Или ветер дул не такой, да? Сто процентов, как они нас называют, конечно, террористы, сепаратисты, сепаратисты. Да? Но народ-то видел, вы, репортеры, видели, кто стрелял из минометов, чьи самолеты, вертолеты летали. Как можно было вообще? Ну, мы зашли в здание аэропорта, да? Четко, вот так, просто, вот как-то живо. Не трогать вообще имущество аэропорта, потому что оно построено на наши же деньги. Туда вломлены многие миллионы, короче, ну, гривен, долларов, чего не посчитай, да? Никто даже окурка не кинул там, понимаете? А тут прилетает авиация и начинает бомбить. Я очень сожалею о тех хлопцах, кто там остался. Я очень надеюсь, что их, что их очень мало, очень надеюсь. Потому что это, это настоящие пацаны. Многих из них я знал в лица. С многими здоровался за руку. Если бы не вот эти ебаные политики, мы бы продолжали ходить на рыбалку вместе. Встречались бы под водой или еще где-нибудь. Это настоящие пацаны. Это профессионалы. Это сраная страна. Им должна, как земля колхозу. Понимаешь? Да, конечно. А их там убивали, короче. Ну, и наемники, короче. Понимаешь? И вот этот... Я бы назвал его дружественный огонь. Ukrainian military planes shoot flares into the sky above Donetsk. This near the airport where militant separatists seized a terminal after the country's election. As Ukraine's so-called anti-terrorist operation continues in the east of the country, the leader of the self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic has addressed a crowd of around 2,000 activists vowing to continue the fight for a break with Kiev. We have the entire southeast ahead of us, he said. I'm sure we will advance further. The crowd sang along to a popular Soviet-era song and chanted Donbass, Russia, referring to the region where the separatist movement has taken hold. Ukraine's government has promised to push ahead with a military offensive against the rebels. That's despite a deadly attack on a Ukrainian army helicopter and amid increasing reports that fighters from Russia have been involved in the rebellion in the east. Украинские пограничники не пропустили в Россию автобус с беженцами из Славянска. Об этом сообщил уполномоченный по правам ребенка Павел Астахов. Правда, пересечь границу им все-таки удалось, но пешком, с детьми на руках, рассказывает Алексей Конопко. Накануне в 5 часов утра после очередной бомбежки, когда снаряды начали падать возле детской больницы Славянска, несколько матерей забрали малышей и выехали в сторону России. После последней бомбежки отказали ноги, и она начала падать. После только пол пузырька вальянки она стала на ноги. А младший ребенок чуть не потерял сознание от испуга. Я не знала, кого спасать. Мы жили почти сутки в подвале. Я даже покормить детей не могла. Все, кто мог, помогали вещи, ну, по пыхах собирались, что могли кидать. Дали. Вещи тяжелые. Все помогали. Брали мужчины, все брали сумки тяжелючие, несли детей. Через границу пробирались буквально на ощупь. Пешком в темноте, по тропинкам, которые знают только местные. Автобус с беженцами украинские пограничники пропускать не захотели. Это при том, что ехали в нем только 17 женщин и 21 ребенок. Добраться до ближайшего города людям помогали уже наши пограничники. Нам вчера солдаты помогли. Вещи тянут. А какие солдаты? 
Добрые наши. Мы для них враги. Мы мирные жители. Мирные жители. Мы ничего. Вот он враг. Этот враг. Вот. вот стоит. Два ребенок. Крошка. Он враг. Он сепаратист. Он террорист. Как можно назвать свой народ врагом? информацию спасите людей всех донбасса юго-востока украины и вообще украине мы не хотим не им мы смерти не ни себе да. мы хотим мира А я откуда знаю? Ну это без ума, это без, без мозга. Это баванка. Вот нашли здесь садики. Вот остался осколок. Debris, all that's left of the first floor of Alexander's house. 
A few days ago, a devastating firefight took place between Ukrainian forces and pro-Russian separatists who had briefly seized the nearby Donetsk airport. More than 40 rebels were killed in the most forceful military operation since the insurgency erupted here in eastern Ukraine in early April. Alexander's house came under fire from a Ukrainian helicopter. A shell fell on the roof, maybe 30 centimeters above the ceiling of the first floor. We had two stories here, and the fire started inside. On the first floor, only the bathtub remains. Everything else was burnt to ashes. Alexander had just finished building this house with his son after eight years of construction work. He didn't have insurance and won't be compensated. According to local residents, about half a dozen other houses were damaged in this neighborhood, and snipers are still active here. Many people have fled already. Others choose to stay despite the risks. Ukrainian forces have regained control of the airport, but shots still ring out in this neighborhood. The residents who have stayed live in fear every day, as they wonder for how long the situation will last.